wearing the reflective markers. <laughs> and then we, my second bowler is right here. Does anybody know who this is? Mike? It is Mike Fabian. So you guys have seen and heard a lot of Mike this week, weekend, but he likes to hang out here, so we get to use him. So with the motion analysis system, we're able to graph these shots. So this is a side view of a shot. So we have the setup going into the push away, top of the back swing, and the release is going to be right around in here, and then it's follow through. What do you track on your neck? What is that marker? This is the this is the hand, so the right hand through the shot. Yeah. And then what's great about exporting to Excel is that we can put another shot on top of it and see how consistent they are. Now Mike would normally be a lot more consistent than, than this, but in the lab setting there weren't any boards for him to line up on. All he had was a piece of tape kind of help them line up vert, um, longitudinally from the foul line. But left and right was a little bit off because they didn't have anything to really line up on. But even then you can see how consistent he is in the shape of his swing. He started this one a little bit lower, but he got it up to the same point, and the roundness are, is very similar to the first shot. And we can look at a third shot, and you kind of split the difference between the two of them. And then we can take it and look at a different view. So this view would be as if you're standing behind him as he's on the approach and walking towards the foul line. So it's going to be a little bit more compact than this view. I tried to scale the the one meter distance left to right to the one meter up and down. So that's going to kind of bring it out a little bit. And you have to notice that like this distance right here is only going to be about 20 centimeters. So it's, it's very simple, very much more compact than what it appears to be. But we can, once again, add another shot. So we see the second shot, he actually lined up to the right of the first shot, but he still, at the release point, got very close to the same point. So it means that he's very target oriented a little bit. Um, that he, although when he lined up, he might not have been in the same spot, but as he got to closer to the foul line, he was looking at where he was going to throw it. He made the the adjustments that he needed to to get into the same position. And when we had a third shot, he lined up even further right, but didn't quite get back to the same position. Yes. Yeah, there were only three shots, so these are the same three shots. And so this is a view from up above that we don't normally get to see. And since the scaling is a little bit different, that's why this one seems a lot more compact than the view from behind. But this is the back of the approach here. The foul line is up here. So he has his push away, and he comes back, and he goes forward. And then that's shot two on top of shot one. And then finally with shot three as well. So this is going to give us a lot more ability to really look at how consistent a, a player is and really look at, with the combination of cats, being able to find a bad shot and look at it and see really what is going on. Is it a push away issue or is it just an alignment issue? Are they setting up in the same spot and have, this, have a shots to go different ways or are they lining up completely different? So this gives us a lot the ability to look at it more accurately and more intuitively as to what is going on. So now we can look at 
the position and velocity of the swing. So this is still with the hand. So in the graph above, we have, there's actually three shots here, even though it only looks like two. So this is how high his hand is from the ground. So this is the ground here, and this is over time. So this is really looking at, at his timing and how consistent his timing is. So what we did is we just sync it up to his, what we feel is his release point, which is going to be the, the minimum point. So the closest he is to the ground, and we just set those time frames up and then went backwards. So this is his push away, the bottom of his backswing as he's bringing it back, and then the top of his backswing, and then the release point and his follow through. So by getting the position data, we're able to get velocity. So this is actually magnitude. So this is a combination of all three coordinates, the x, y, and z uh, velocities. Basically, in order to get that, you take the square root of all three axes squared and added together. And that gives you magnitude. So we're graphing that. So as we see, as he gets into the push away, is the velocity of his swing increases. And then as he starts to go up into his back swing, it decreases. So he's right here is going to be the minimum of his swing. It's right in line with the top of his back swing. And as he comes down, the velocity of his swing is going to increase up into the release point. And then as he gets into his follow through, the velocity is going to decrease. So I was asked last night what the velocity of a swing is. Well, for Mike, the max velocity is right around 8 meters per second. So 8 meters per second is about 17.9 miles per hour. And last year at camp, we measured Mike's normal ball velocity as, I don't remember, I wrote it down, as 18.71 miles per hour. So that's pretty close to what he was at. So the, the end the highest point of his arm swing is right about the, his normal release velocity. Now in the laboratory setting, he's having to walk over panels that aren't fixed to the ground, so it's gonna be a little bit uneasy for him, so I'm sure that he wasn't throwing as fast as his normal at, in the laboratory setting. So that's probably gonna be pretty close. So that was, for Mike anyways, his, his release velocity is pretty similar to his, his peak max velocity of his arm swing. And then if we look at his minimum swing, minimum velocity of his swing, that's right about one and a half meters per second, which is about 3.3 miles per hour, which is gonna be very consistent with a, a normal walking pace. So that means that he's at the top of his swing, his swing velocity is pretty much equal to how fast he's moving forward. So that shows that yeah, it's moving up, but it, it does kind of pause a little bit. It's just the only movement is him moving forward, like you and Honda were speaking earlier. So that brings us to what my thesis is, which is the effects of kinematic parameters on ball speed and 10 pin bowling. So a professor wanted me to do something that would be useful to the sport of bowling. So I sat down with Rod and Brian, and we had a long discussion on what we could do. Because there's plenty of things that I could look at. We could look at comparison, comparing the arm swing between going up five versus swinging it out. There's gonna be differences in the alignment and the swing. But we felt that the most important thing would be something that is a, seems to be a hot topic right now, is how do you change ball speed? So what is the best way of changing ball speed and what's the most accurate way? So that's what we're really looking at. So how do you change ball speed? The most common way and the way it's been taught the most is to raise the ball in your starting position to throw it faster and to lower it to throw it slower. And to also move back on the approach to throw it faster and move closer to the foul line to throw it slower. And there's also ways of, you want to get your ball into your swing quicker 
and throw it harder and throw it faster or to delay the ball getting into your swing and throwing it, you just slowing down your swing in order to throw it slower. So we want to look at it and see what is the best way. But if you look at Fred Borden's book, Rolling Knowledge is the Key from 1987, we have a, a figure that shows a fast bowler holding the ball low and a slow bowler holding it high. Now, of course, this is to try and synchronize the arm swing and the foot tempo, not to change ball speed. So this is trying to make timing better so that if you have a fast bowler, you want to make sure that the arm swing is consistent with the footwork. And, and Rod, you want to add in on this a little bit? Oh, I get my plug, OK. Um, this is kind of been, you've seen this in the, the literature and teachings for a long time, that if you have fast feet, you want to keep the ball down low. But you want to have your ball with your feet in synchronization or timing at the release. If you have slower feet, you want to have, hold the ball high. Well, that made sense to get everything in timing, but we were still teaching the football faster to hold it high. Well, wait a minute, is that going to make you slow down your feet to stay in time? Or that if you wanted to throw it slower, you held it down low, is that going to make your feet go faster? So it created some, some interesting questions. And with my experience with Team USA, Junior Team USA, especially the kids, is that we were trying to teach them to be more versatile. And they would do what they were always taught, is hold the ball higher and throw it faster. But they weren't very consistent at it. And through looking at this and going to just basic, it kind of made sense. Let's just get the ball down lower and get our feet moving. Well, that was unheard of. Why would you ever do that? But it ended up being easier for them. So we started doing it, playing for almost 10 years of doing this now, and with Kim and a few others at their Team USA. And it's actually getting to some of the manuals now that it works, but it doesn't work for everybody. You know, it's a learned skill, it's biomechanics, it's not just. You know, physics and motion is biomechanics. It kind of matches into this. So that's where he kind of went into his thesis. Let's just find it out. Let's just go in there and get away from this stuff about we think, we think, let's find out what we have. So that's what created this whole project, so to speak. Right. And so for my study, we have three different starting ball heights. We have normal, for some reason, the normal starting ball height for most people is right here, which is very helpful for my study, so that we have a normal raise it up and lower. Um, but we, when raising up, I'm trying to have them raise it up as high as they can, and when lowering it, trying to lower it as low as they can. Ideally, it would be a full ball width difference between the three of them. And then for starting distance from the foul line, I measure their normal starting distance and we go 10% closer and 10% further away. So if they're 300 centimeters away from the foul line, then we move them up 30 centimeters and move them back 30 centimeters. And it's roughly about a foot and a half difference in starting distance, which is a good distance uh, change for changing ball speed. So different test conditions that, that we're using, we're doing while standing normal distance from the foul line, raising the ball up and throwing both fast and slow from this position, and then lowering the ball down and throwing both fast and slow from this position. And then we are moving further back from the foul line, trying to throw it faster while holding the ball up higher, lower, and then also in their normal position, and then moving the, the closer distance, normal, higher, and lower, trying to throw it slower. So in summary of the test conditions, that means that there's 11 test conditions. So if anyone has done research, that's a lot of independent variables and a lot of different test conditions. And when doing my prospectus interview with my professors on my study, they got really uneasy with this. In fact, a lot of it's just because of the statistics that go along with it. Because I'm actually going to have to do two runs of uh, Statistics: one with the changes in distance, and then one where they're all standing in their normal position. In fact, one of my professors sat back in their chair and went like this because they were so frustrated with how many conditions I'm going to have. But the study really wouldn't be worth doing if we didn't look at the whole picture. And so that's why we have to have all these conditions. We want to look to see what the effect is of the height changes in height, and also the effects of changing distance and what they are interrelated to each other. 
So we're going to do a minimum of five shots each for each of the conditions. Like I said earlier, that with the direct linear uh, transformation, this wouldn't be possible because that's a, probably a year's worth of, of processing and digitizing just on one person. <coughs> and so that's 55 total trials per person. I'm going to do at least 20 individuals. So with methods, we have Stephanie here wearing the reflective markers. We're doing using eight optical cameras with 56 markers for a static trial and 35 markers for dynamic. So with the static, we're including the medial side of the body. So the inside of the knees, inside of the ankles, inside of the elbows, where if during a dynamic trial, we can't have those because those markers would get in the way of the movement and make a very unnatural feeling and difficult to get real results. But through the process of motion analysis with computer programming, we can actually reconstruct the data of where these markers are in order to get the full picture about having them during the dynamic trials. So we're able to get rid of 20 uh, markers without having any negative effects to the data. And for my study, we're actually using three digital video cameras as well, with three with uh, tape placed on the bowling ball. Because we can't put markers on the bowling ball because of how the bowling ball flares, the markers would get in the way, and it would disrupt ball motion, and they'd also get lost in the, in the machines at the end of the lanes. And Rod would get mad at me because they cost $5 a piece, and it just cost too much. So we have to use reflective tape, which means that I have to actually go in and do direct linear transformation on each of the shots just to get the bowling ball. Because by having the bowling ball included as a segment, what we're able to do is really fine tune the exact time that the release point happens. And from there, we can get a better idea of the uh, kinematic chain and the actual timing of the motion of the hips and the arms, uh, like Connor. Under and you all were talking about earlier with the elastic tension and the rotation, we can actually measure that a lot more accurately if we have a release point. This was one of the areas that was really tough to explain to the professors is you got to understand the bowling ball, and bowling ball flares and it's not on the hand, it's going to move around. And they couldn't understand why we couldn't put static marks on the bowling ball and have it be there at all at the same time. Because there's so many more dynamics <coughs> going on, especially once the ball is released, you have that flare. You say, well, why can't you put some tape here? Well, we're tracking the shots as well. So he's tracking it with cats going down the lane. So you don't want to roll them over your like tape to change the ball motion. So this was a tougher study than a lot of people thought. Yeah. And I also forgot to mention that this is, I'm doing it on women, because uh, women have had less studies done on them in bowling, and so we feel that it's important to include them on some groundbreaking data. And it's also one less variable to just include women and not men, because men would include a whole other scenario. You have gender to deal with, but also they do change ball speed a lot differently. And by just looking at women, they're probably going to be a lot more useful information to uh, transfer over to developing male bowlers and ones that have not figured out a system of changing ball speed on their own. They can find, we can use it to develop a system for them that's going to be more accurate and more useful for them. And then, like Rod said, we're going to be tracking the ball motion, so we're using that through CATS and through shock repeatability analysis. So CATS is computer aided tracking system. And there's five sensors on the lane that we use for tracking the position of the ball. And because we're tracking the position of the ball, we can get the ball speed, relief, the initial ball speed as it's going down the lane. And we'll be able to look at release velocity range, target arrow range, breakpoint range, and then the launch angle range. And we're going to get into more detail about what each of these different variables are. So when you get a CATS report, you get a chart that shows how you did overall on your ranges. And so we have each of the four points here, release velocity range, target error range, break point, and launch angle. And you get a description of how you did. And the lower your number is, the closer you are to elite, it says it's the, you're the better bowler you are. 
And so the more consistent you are, the higher average roller you should be. And we want these to be consistent on whether or not you're changing ball speed or not. And so I included this in order to give you an idea of how CATS works, because we're going to show some graphs and we're going to put a line where the elite level is at. So I want you to have a better understanding of what we're actually showing you. So release velocity range is generally referenced to timing. So if you have problems or issues with your timing, then that can mean that you might have a larger range in your release velocity range. And for cats, the elite level is less than 0.47 miles per hour. Now, there's been a couple of studies done in biomechanics that have been looking at ways of changing ball speed. And they have found that they were looking at different methods. They have actually looked at um, changing ball position heights. And what their results found was that the change in ball speed was a quarter of a mile per hour. But if you look at cats, with cats at the meat level being greater, I mean, excuse me, less than 0.47, a change in a quarter of a mile or 0.25 would still fall under the elite level. So is the, where the findings that they found really that significant. It could just been their random um, inconsistency of the player or the, the natural inconsistency of the player. I guess one thing to explain about CATS, CATS, computer aid tracking system, is just a tool. You know, sometimes it gets into a process and you can use CATS for very different things because it's sensors and how you pull that data out. So, there's very a lot of uses that you can actually use CATS for, but uh, it should be referenced that this time when we have the 0.47 miles an hour and everything, that's over hundreds and hundreds and thousands of bowlers that they've tracked based off their entering average, and that's up where they found the consistency. But we're really using the sensor just to look at repeatability. So CATS is just a tool, just like a drill press is a piece of a tool, screwdriver is a tool. It's going to be different on how you use it different applications. Yep. So this is a graph. Uh, of the preliminary results that I have gotten. So I've, this includes seven molars so far. Uh, so I'm not even halfway finished yet. But the green line represents the elite level that Cat says elite players should be at. So this is roughly 0.47 <coughs> miles per hour. The blue line, the blue bars represent the shot to shot variability of the shots. So this is the actual Cat's data of the ranges. And this is the average, the average of the seven players. And then the red line is their actual change in ball speed off of their normal ball speed. And so they're negative because it's, this is going slower. So since they're, this is their normal shot here, so there's no change in ball speed because it's their normal shot. The blue, the blue on the top, the lower the bar, the more consistent that player is. <coughs> And on the red on the bottom, the larger that ball, the more range you actually have. Correct. So this is my coding system. So I'll try it. The first letter represents the speed. So S means that they were throwing slower. In here means that it's their normal speed. The second letter represents the ball height. So H is for high, L is low, N is normal. And then the third letter is their distance from the foul line. So C is closer and N is normal. So as you can see, standing closer with a lower ball position, they actually had through the ball the slowest on average. And holding higher and staying closer, they didn't throw it as slow. But their range was a little bit more consistent compared to holding it lower and throwing it slower. So you, they get they have a little bit better results in change in ball speed, but their shot to shot repeatability was better when raising it up. Now you have to keep in mind that these bowlers have all been trained to throw it like this in the, the SLC call. And they haven't really practiced or been trained to throw it in this way. I just told them to do it, they threw a couple practice shots, and then they did it. Some of them with some of these conditions were very had a very difficult time in their initial um, 
practice shots of even getting started, getting the ball into their swing, because it was very unnatural and uncomfortable for them because they hadn't practiced it. But as you'll see, we'll talk about some areas, other areas where even though they weren't as practiced with it, their shot, their shot repeatability was a little bit better. Yes? So, um, just so I understand, by looking at the fourth bar, by all of your, your seven, they, by raising the ball up and standing in their normal spot, they all improved their consistency? Yes. They, yeah, this one they improved their consistency and they slowed down their ball speed about 0.2 miles per hour. Okay. So that's where, that, that brings us to a good uh, point, is that a lot of times when bowlers feel like they're, they're in a funk or in, like they're, they feel like their timing's not good or they're just not throwing the ball well, just um, slight changes in their ball height can actually get them more in sync and so they actually start throwing the ball better. So that's one easy tip that a bowler can change on the fly without having to practice much or getting a whole lesson, just raise it up or lower it a little bit in competition in order to make sure they start throwing the ball better. Okay. So we can also look at throwing faster. So now the, the red is in the positive because there are increases in change in ball speed. So now the first letter is F for fast instead of S for slow. And then the last F is for further away. So the green line represents the elite level again. So when raising and lowering their shot to shot repeatability looks like it's very similar. And once again, the, the traditional way, the way that most of them are trained to, to increase ball speed, they produce greater results or greater change of ball speed but then the non-trained way. But over time, this training level could actually increase once they become more used to that type of, of, of bowling. I think one thing that this, these two charts really show to you, you have to do the two, whatever way you use, you have to use the ball height and starting position together. That's where you're going to see the biggest increase of consistency and variation in, in speed. If you get into these charts and you look at just changing ball height and not changing distance, it's not as consistent whether you're going faster, slower, higher, or lower. You want to use both of them at the same time. Right. Yes? Did, did you actually uh, ask them how they were trained to bowl faster or slower? Um, I would say that six of the seven were trained to raise it up to throw it faster and lower it to throw it slower. Okay. The only one that would be different is Kim because she's actually practiced both ways mm -hmm. more so than the others. <laughs> so next is target arrow range. So this is a targeting reference. So looking at more of what they're looking at is going to be affected by arm swing as well. So if there's problems with their arm swing that can affect their ability to hit their target. If the way they look at the lane can affect their ability to hit their target as well. And for all the bowlers, they were told to target the second arrow for consistency uh, of, from uh, participant to participant. So when they changed, when they were going faster, they didn't move over and, and go up five or go slow, they didn't move in. They were all, for all test conditions, they were bowling on sole oil pattern and targeting second arrow. So the elite level for target arrow range is less than 0.7 boards, which if you translate that to inches is about two inches, maybe a little bit less. And I just don't know about centimeters, sorry. So here are the, the graphs for that. This is good for going slow. The red area is going to be the same for all of these charts. Um, the only thing that's changing is the blue. So for this, you can see that holding it higher when going slower was significantly more consistent than holding it low to throw slow. And actually holding it low in order to go slower was, they were actually the least consistent out of all of the, the test conditions for throwing slow. Oops. And then for going faster, we see that with the target arrow range, holding it low to go fast was not as consistent 
and it's holding higher to go faster. But they were still pretty close to the same and still better than the other conditions other than holding it low and standing in their normal position. That's what's was kind of interesting is that they're standing in the same spot holding it low, they go faster, they were actually more consistent than, than holding it higher and then standing in, the, in their normal position. So there's a little bit of um, variability from, from here to here based off of how close and how farther away they were from the fountain. So is there anything that when they raised the ball fresh so it's slower at the same distance, they were more consistent, and the same thing here when they were at their normal it actually ended up being more consistent. So this was something that we didn't anticipate seeing. Yeah. Nick? Yes. Do you have data how when they changed the height of, of the star and how much actually the height of the back screen changed? We will. Once I okay. once I process the uh, motion capture data, we we'll know that. That's actually one of my variables as well. Yeah. Okay. So that leads us to breakpoint range. They talk about high, yeah. Okay. So breakpoint range looks at arm swing and release. Those are the two things that can have an effect on your ability to control your breakpoint. And the elite level is less than 3.1 boards. So when throwing slower, we can see that. Oops, wrong button. When holding it higher to throw slow, the new way uh, was the, actually the only one that was really under the elite level. The rest of the, the test conditions were not as consistent as what the elite level was other than standing at the normal condition. Normal distance from the foul line produced right at the elite level. And so far for our throwing fast, we have similar results. We're holding it low to throw faster, produce better results under below the elite level, and a little bit better than holding it higher to throw faster. Still, this was below the elite level, so they'd still be seeing a